Ave Maria. The Pharisees went away to work out between them how to trap Jesus and what he said. And they sent their disciples to him together with the Herodians to say, Master, we know that you are an honest man and teach the way of God in an honest way and that you are not afraid of anyone because a man's rank means nothing to you. Tell us your opinion then. Is it permissible to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus was aware of their malice and replied, You hypocrites, why do you set this trap for me? Let me see the money you pay the tax with. They handed him a denarius. And he said, Whose head is this? Whose name? Caesar's, they replied. He then said to them, Very well, give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. When we hear the gospel being proclaimed, when a passage is taken out of the sacred scriptures, we should ponder on it. And what does pondering on it mean? Which we should try to, first of all, understand what our Lord is saying at the time he spoke, but more important, what is he saying to us today? For us to understand what he meant when he first spoke, we need to have a context. We need to understand the circumstances of the time, the culture of the time, the political niceties of the time. And once we have this, we can then apply it to our own times. We can apply it to our own lives. And so, let us consider the circumstances in which our Lord spoke. Our Lord, who the prophets had foretold, came into the world to save sinners. And this work he began at the age of 30 by first of all speaking to the multitudes. He then worked various signs, miracles, to validate what he was saying. And of course, um, miracles, signs, <coughs> are going to attract the people. The, el the, the, the leaders, scribes, Pharisees, and so on, came initially. And then they notice that the people were paying less and less attention to them and more to our Lord. And this led to envy and then ultimately to enmity. Since the people who were attracted to our Lord, and since the miracles were evident, and since our Lord was, by his very manner, criticizing the authorities, he said that they were not, they were, they, they were hirelings, they were not shepherds. Um, he was not under minor authority because he said, you see the scribes and Pharisees, they sit on the chair of Moses, do what they tell you. But he criticized what they did. This would only aggravate their hatred for him. And it became plain hatred. They could not catch him out in what he was teaching. But they looked at the signs that he worked, and they gave it an evil interpretation. So, for instance, they said, he's cast out demons, can't deny it, but he's doing it by the power of Beelzebub. So they were trying to undermine even 
the miracles. They couldn't deny the reality of them, but they gave it a false interpretation. And this is the essence of hypocrisy. And really, it is the culmination of envy. Our Lord had already answered the Pharisees. So what did they do? We read the scriptures very carefully. We pay attention to the words that are used. Each verse. The Pharisees went away to work out between them how to trap Jesus in what he said. Our Lord has just answered them. So they go away. And they consult among themselves. God forbid that we should be among those who consult in evil. They go away to discuss how to trap him. What can we do to catch him out in what he says? So what did they come up with? And they sent their disciples to him. Ah, okay. So the first thing is they stand aside and send others, their disciples, their servants, so that it would not appear as if they were responsible. But they're not content to just send in their disciples. They sent them together with the Herodians. So there are two groups now who are going to tackle our Lord. Now, in the time of our Lord, the Jewish people were divided into various sects. There were the Pharisees, who were basically what today would call nationalists. They regarded themselves as separated from the people. They regarded themselves as leaders who observe the strictness of the law, the Mosaic law. They didn't want anything to do with Gentiles. Absolutely nothing, no communication with foreigners, aliens, non-Jews. Consequently, they hated the Romans. There were, on the other side, the Herodians. The Herodians were people, as the name suggests, who followed Herod. Now, the Romans had been in Palestine for nearly 100 years. How did they get there? There was a conflict among the Jews over the high priesthood and the leadership. And since they couldn't resolve the problem, they adopted what was called today the Muslim solution, or the Turkish solution. What was that? Well, in Christian times, uh, well, I guess the 14th, 15th century, if two Christian kings, states, couldn't agree, they would ask the, the Ottomans to come and solve the problem. And of course, the Ottomans would come in and they'd take over both. And that's what happened to the, to the Jews. They could not agree among themselves, so they invited the Romans to come and mediate. Well, um, Pompey did. He came in and he took over. And so the Romans basically took charge of Palestine. What did they do? Was it negative? No, on the contrary. They established peace. They established order. They built roads. They were looking after the country. That takes money. So they wanted taxes to be paid. How could they get the taxes? Well, we'll give them a king. The king they had was Herod the Great. Herod the Great wasn't a Jew, he was half Jew. But because the Romans had made him king, he was certainly a loyal son of Rome. He was going to support Roman authority. He was succeeded by his son, <clears throat> another Herod, and he, this second Herod adopted the same policy. So 
their followers are called Herodians, and they were all for supporting Roman authority in Palestine, in Judea. So we have these two camps, these two sects, who are opposed to each other. One says no to Roman authority, Roman rule, Roman taxes. The other one says yes. So, as you'd expect, they were natural enemies. They didn't agree. But truth appears. Truth appears in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. They hate him. Both of them. Don't forget that Herod was responsible for the death of John the Baptist because John had dared to interfere in the private life of the king and was causing a public scandal and saying to the king, it's not right for you to have your brother's wife. So John is beheaded. So Herod thought, in fact, that, it, that our Lord was John come back to life. So there was this suspicion on the part of Herod. And his followers likewise would pick up that sentiment. So they gladly joined together to confront the truth. How were they going to do this? Well, a little more hypocrisy. They said, Master, Hmm. They start by flattering him. We know that you are an honest man. Surely that's the height of flattery. We know you're honest. But they're not content with just saying what he is by character. They're also going to say what he is by office and you teach the way of God in an honest way. Teach the way of God in an honest way. It's possible to teach the way of God dishonestly. You could do it for money or you could do it without understanding. We call it heresy. But they say no. We're doing it correctly. Well, there's a problem here. If they, they say they know, not that we believe or that we think, which is, we could be wrong, but they're talking about a fact. We know. That is factual. If they know this, logically, shouldn't they follow him? Shouldn't they believe in him? He is teaching the way of God, what's more important than to know the way of God? This is the way to eternal life. We know you're doing this in an honest way, without any consideration for personal advantage or that you might be mistaken. If they really knew this, they should follow. The mere fact they do not follow indicates that they, they are the ones who are not being sincere. So, they are not content with digging six feet. They're going to dig even more, dig deeper. And that you are not afraid of anyone. So you're a courageous man. You're not only honest, but you're courageous, and you're not going to permit anyone to intimidate you. You're not afraid of anyone because a man's rank means nothing to you. A man's rank? Well, we know that you are so honest, so virtuous, so courageous, that you're not even afraid of Caesar. A man's rank means nothing to you. In other words, you are so God-directed that your opinion is trustworthy. That's what they're saying. So, essentially, it's a lot of flattery to make the trap sweet. Tell us then your opinion. 
Now, for us more mere mortals, we probably have taken the bait. The question, is it permissible to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Yes or no? Pay taxes or don't pay them? Yes or no? For us mortals, it would be a very difficult question to answer without follow, following, falling into either camp. Why is this so important? Well, as I said, <clears throat> for the Jews, for the Pharisees, to pay taxes was to deny the independence and the special place that the Israelites had in the relation to God. They were God's people and therefore they could not be slaves to any non-Jew. That's how they saw it. For the Rhodians, who were practical people, look, we live in a, in a world, a practical um, situation. We are protected by the Roman armies. We, we have peace. We are able to go about our business and so on. Well, let us at least compromise, minimum compromise. And so in asking the question, they were setting a terrible trap for our Lord well baited and were told but Jesus was aware of their malice where is malice hidden it's not on the face is it it's on, in the heart because the malicious have an evil intent but their countenance their face is always friendly and gentle and open and so on. But the heart is full of deceit. And our Lord, we are told, was aware of their malice. He was aware of what was in their heart. He was aware of the serpent lurking there. And so, what does he do? Our Lord answers twice. He answers, first of all, their heart, and secondly, their words. So he says, you hypocrites, he goes straight for the heart. They came with sweet words, his response is harsh. Because he's answering the evil in the heart. And that must always be struck harshly. And then, he exposes it. Why do you set this trap for me? And now he's going to address the words. Let me see the money you pay the tax with. So they're forced to present him with a coin. And he looks at the coin and he asks the question. Whose image? Whose name? They are compelled to answer Caesar's. Every coin has the image of the monarch and the name of the monarch stamped in it. And if there's no monarch, it at least has the state, an image, a badge, a motto of the state, and the name of the country. So it's clearly identified. In this case, it belongs to Caesar. What is, what is coinage? What is money used for? Well, it's used to barter, used to pay taxes. It is the common currency for exchange. It is something minted by the state. So the Lord responds, very well. Since you are using a coin minted by Caesar to live in the country governed by Caesar, then give it back to Caesar. 
because the mere fact they were using the coin was indicative that they were participating in the system. A system which the Pharisees hated, but they were participating. The mere fact they used the currency was indicative of that. But the issue at hand, the, 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 the point of conflict between the Herodians and the Pharisees was really one of religion. Does religion forbid us to participate in civil um, intercourse, with civil um, needs? That's what was being asked. Should the civil and the religious be separated? And our Lord says, no. And says, and says so, and to God, what belongs to God? So then, of course, we ask the question, well, what does belong to the state? What does belong to Caesar? And what, in fact, does belong to God? Well, it's easy enough in regard to Caesar. What the state requires of us is all the things necessary for the smooth running of the state. But what does God require? And why does he require it? God requires of us our bodies, our souls, and our wills. Why? Because we have been made in his image and likeness. And secondly, because we baptize, we have taken on his name. That's why we call Christians, is it not? Christ has redeemed us, our bodies, and our souls, by pouring out his blood. He has redeemed us. We have been bought at a great price, the price of the innocent lamb. We've been bought by the, the, the suffering and death of the Son of God. And therefore, St. Paul tells us, we have to use our bodies for the glory of God. Secondly, our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, and therefore we must use them accordingly. Our souls have been made for God, and therefore, when we, when we look at the commandments, this is what is required of us. And so our wills, our choices, must always be for what God requires of us. Now, we live in a um, pluralistic society, and the laws, as we well know, are not always in accord with what God requires of us. And so, as Christians, we are frequently faced with what could be a dilemma. How do we observe the law of the land when the law itself is contradictory to what God requires. We can think, for instance, the law regarding life itself, especially unborn life. Well, certainly we do not participate in it, because the commandments clearly state, thou shalt not kill. But even so, we need to make it known that we disagree with the law. How we do that will depend on prudence. But none, and some people are called to greater sacrifices than others. But nonetheless, each of us in our own way ought to make known that there are laws on the books to which we as Christians cannot accede and that we reject. So, to give an example where there are people who are willing to go all the way, even to prison. And we can take the case where it's forbidden, for instance, to pray outside um, abortion places. As an example, it's forbidden to pray, but there are people who will go and pray. And if we think of how in Congress this is, that you cannot even pray silently, you cannot pray in your mind. There's a case to that effect at the moment. 
someone praying in a mine outside such a place, and they're arrested. Isn't that an infringement on what we have just read? Because we're rendering to God what is his own. Our bodies, our souls, our consciences, and our will. So certainly, as Christians, we are living in a time where we will have to stand up for what we believe. And we think, whilst we are fortunate here, there are many other places in the world where our co-religious Catholics are being persecuted. Persecuted for freedoms we still have here. So we can think in China, we can think in the Middle East, in many places, in Iran. We, can, we know what's happening in the Middle East, in Palestine, in Africa. Christians, Catholics are being persecuted. South America, we know um, Catholic priests are being expelled from some countries. We know this. We are still fortunate. But if we do not hold fast to the liberties we currently have, if we permit them to be eaten off, we're going to end up in very much the same circumstances as our co-religious elsewhere. So then, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but to God what belongs to God. And what belongs to God is, our Lord tells us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria.